Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you call home. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All of our attendees are on mute, but we still like to keep our webinars as interactive as possible. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter them in the question section of the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll try and answer them as they come in. We'll also be closing the session with a live Q&A. Okay, so let's get started. Thanks so much for joining our webinar today, Driving Service Improvements in Value and IT Operations. I'm Kyle Benaz, Director of Marketing at Netrail, and I'll be your host today. As mentioned, please send any and all questions and I'll make sure we get them answered for you. I'd like to introduce you to our guest speakers today. First up, I'm joined by James Mancini, Principal Solution Architect and one of the co-founders of Netrail. And we're also joined by our guest speakers, Paul Almany, VP of Technical Consulting, and Alex Ulbrich, CTO of Whitlock Infrastructure Solutions. Today, we'll be exploring ways to identify, deliver, and communicate business value in IT operations. With that, I'll pass the ball to Paul and Alex. <clears throat> the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Kyle and James, and thanks to all those attending today or listening after the fact. Obviously, today's topic focuses on value and more specifically how to drive value in IT operations. To start the discussion, we'd like to take a quick audience poll to better understand your current environment and the organization's perspective on IT operations. But before you respond to the poll, the question is not so much about whether the organization values operations, as obviously all operations are appreciated for the hard work and dedication to keeping the lights on, but more about the organized organization recognizing how operations and operations initiatives contribute business value and enable the business to operate in ways which better support differentiation and competitive advantage. So with that context, if you will take a few moments and objectively select the answer that best aligns with your organization, we'll get going. And thanks for your response. All right, we'll leave this open for uh, just a few more seconds. Looks like we've still got some responses trickling in. All righty, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this. Actually, still got them trickling in, so give it just a few more seconds. All right, so let's close this out. And let's see our results real quick. Okay, so about 11% uh, gave us a no. Uh, about a third of the audience said probably not, and then ah, that's good to see. About half of uh, the audience says, uh, the business clearly understands the value of IT operations. Really interesting stuff there. Yeah, that's great to see. And uh, for those who have something in place, uh, hopefully you'll find some nuggets in this discussion to perhaps uh, Im improve your approach. And for those who don't, we certainly would like to help you get jump started. So again, thanks for your response. And so when we start talking about value creation, uh, particularly in operations, you don't have to look far to identify barriers that often appear to toward our best intentions and bringing real value to the organization and our own personal satisfaction as knowledge workers who by definition are in nature are really driven to contribute and innovate. So let's take a brief look at some of the common barriers we encounter in operations uh, engagements and engagements that we've been, uh, conducted over uh, many, many years of working with operations. So of course, at the top of the list is time. Uh, the most precious commodity in every aspect of life is a particularly uh, prominent barrier, as the typical day is often dominated by unplanned and critical demands associated with events, incidents, and urgent requests. While adding hours to the day is obviously not a non-starter for all of us, uh, taking a few minutes out of the day or week to focus on value opportunities can reap uh, very large rewards, as those opportunities often lead to efficiencies that recapture time that we can use elsewhere and for creating new value. Next on the list is the linkage to business objectives and in business terms. This is not to say that, again, that operations initiatives do not typically have business value, but more that IT initiatives are not frequently linked to business objectives and expressed in non-technical terms that convey how they support the objective. This is critical not only to make sure you are doing the right things with limited budget, but also representing the initiatives in a context that the business understands and more importantly, will fund. Uh, and this is particularly true in these times where budgets are flat or shrinking. 
Another barrier that's often encountered in operations, particularly in technology initiatives or projects, is what we often call the shiny object syndrome. In many, if not most, technology or solution deployments, it's easy to get distracted with amazing capabilities that might be available in a solution that are not fundamental to the real objectives. This often leads to protracted timelines, budget overruns, and in extreme cases, project failure. To avoid this, we need to stay laser focused on the most critical or irrefutable capabilities required to support the objectives. This is particularly important in the first release or rollout. By focusing on these critical capabilities, you can deliver the expected value and then garner the support for subsequent releases or enhancements as new value opportunities arise. Sadly, uh, the next item on the list, which we call build it and they will come, uh, is one of the ones that we have encountered many, many times over the years, where a solution group within the organization or tool group has identified and implemented a potentially high value set of capabilities for the organization, but made the mistake of assuming their intended consumers were actually interested and more importantly, accountable by the organization to leverage those capabilities to realize the anticipated value. The bottom line on this, of course, is make sure you fully engage your consumers or actors to ensure that you know, the anticipated value is realized. The final item on the list, uh, but certainly not the last of the barriers in reality, is communication of value. Uh, this again needs to be expressed in terms the business understands and communicated frequently. The communication should include delivered value of past initiatives as well as planned value and in upcoming initiatives. This is critical to reinforcing the perception of value and in fact value, ensuring ongoing support for new initiatives and an opportunity for the business to reprioritize planned activities. It should also include the recognition of missed value and some assessment of the underlying or root cause of the failure to realize full value. Was it a technical issue? Was it an organizational issue or something else? And then once that underlying root cause is identified, the remaining barrier can be removed and that latent value realized. So with all of these barriers and others uh, presented in the day-to-day -day reality of operations, how do we practically drive value? Well, let's take a look at some of the key activities that should be present to support this concept of value creation. First of those is establishing a culture of, in the organization that is um, conducive to driving value. And while culture is typically driven from the top, you can affect the culture within your group and operations in general simply by starting to discuss and applying some of the value activities and concepts. When you begin to have some success and begin communicating how and what value opportunities you are tracking, it will in most cases drive others and with that, the culture, even if somewhat initially limited in scope, begins to evolve to a more value-focused culture. This, of course, will not happen overnight, but you can make progress even if it's only within your team or group. Even with a, a culture committed to value, you still need a simple, what we think of as a high-speed, low-drag approach to address the very real and present challenges, particular, uh, particularly time. We've already recognized that time is precious and a heavy process or approach on top of already burdened resources is not likely to be successful. So the key is to have an approach uh, that focuses on the most critical elements required to drive value, things like linkage to objectives, key capabilities, identification of consumers and actors, and expected value, and incorporate the most simplistic and time efficient process you can. And in a few slides, we'll share what we call value ops, which strives to incorporate the key activities while minimizing additional overhead on the already burdened organization. Whatever approach you decide is right for you, and obviously some of you already have an approach in place, it should include some guidance on where to find or identify value opportunities. And in particular, where in operations we might typically look. It must also be able to cap capture and support not only the pursuit of quick wins, such as configuration changes that can be implemented quickly, but also larger project or initiative level efforts. Once the opportunities are identified, they should be captured efficiently. Again, this process has to be very, very simple and quick. This could be as simple as an email suggestion box, a simple spreadsheet, or a Teams channel if you're a Teams user. 
where the minimum required information can be captured, reviewed, and tracked. After logging these opportunities, an objective review should be performed routinely to support the prioritization in simple business terms and incorporate the idea of least effort, highest value, or more simply put, biggest bang for the buck. Um, of course, simpler low effort changes with identified value should be implemented as soon as practical, as those represent quick wins and the subsequent value realization can begin almost immediately. Hey, Paul, um, I'm gonna jump in here real quick. It looks like we have a question. So this looks like we need to do an ROI on every opportunity. How can we do that? We're often challenged with even doing an effective ROI on large projects. Will this take a ton yeah. of time? Yeah, uh, yeah, it shouldn't, let's put it that way. And that's a great question. It's one that comes up often. Um, and really to support the evaluation and prioritization activity, you need to minimally assign some measure of effort or investment and some indication of impact or business value. Uh, this should not turn into a complex ROI analysis, at least initially and not unless it requires a significant investment. And that might be associated with a large project or initiative but should generally leverage a gut level estimate expressed in very general terms. Um, similar to t-shirt size examples that you often see leveraged in agile approaches. For example, a level, of, a level of effort might be simply assigned based on hours. It's gonna take hours, days, weeks, or months, or small, medium, and large. And value may be expressed in dollar signs, one, two, three, or four, similar to a restaurant ratings for cost. It's not necessary that you have a, a, an exact value on that and the actual values assigned to each level are arbitrary, but you could assign the ranges you feel appropriate. And this evaluation should be iterative, weekly or monthly as new items are appearing on the backlog and may result in changing the sequence or priority of opportunities pursued. I appreciate you answering that question, Paul. Uh, yeah. Audience, please keep those coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, once you have identified which items to put on the value backlog, you should define what will be used to measure success. And this is a key, very key element. It's, it's, it's more than just capturing the item, um, but it should capture also the, the anticipated value. And that might be a reduction in a certain type of event, reduction in request fulfillment time, reduction in administrative overhead, et cetera. And track that measure and the progress towards the definition of success around that measure. This can be, uh, conveyed in a simple report with status on the realization of that um, goal. Again, even in a simple spreadsheet or Teams channel, uh, providing an ongoing view of delivered value, value in progress, and unplanned value. The result is a running log underscoring, you know, what you have done for me lately and what you're going to do for me. Uh, this also services, surfaces stranded value items that might be quote unquote yellow or intended value or scheduled value that was not realized for some reason and allows you to objectively analyze that, that roadblock or the roadblock that may exist, be a technical organizational or process. And then you can focus on removing uh, whatever that roadblock is and, and go ahead with realization of that value. Uh, per, perhaps even more importantly, it indicates the delivered value uh, or the items that are quote unquote in green in a context that the business understands which ultimately leads to greater support for ongoing and new initiatives, and as a reminder and acknowledgement of the value contributed. So with an understanding of the typical barriers, uh, core activities and building blocks for an approach, you know, who really is responsible for value creation and driving service improvement and operations? Part of the challenge is no one is explicitly accountable for identifying value and rarely do you see anything explicitly related to value in job descriptions. In fact, I've yet to see an org chart with anything like director of value or value analyst or even responsibilities that include identifying and creating value. While we all recognize that, we also know that all of us want to contribute value and to be valued for that contribution. It's human nature and drives us all and I believe is the basis for real job satisfaction. So based on that premise, who is responsible for identifying value opportunities? And the, and the simple answer is everyone. And everyone will have different insights into operations, its inefficiencies and opportunities. In reality, those who are actually doing the operations are the best source for opportunities, rather than big thinkers far removed from the day to day. So simply put, everyone in operations is a potentially untapped source for real opportunities and should be engaged in that activity. 
with everyone potentially generating value opportunities, who prioritizes them? Uh, the prioritization really can happen at any number of levels, including the individual team, department, um, or, or business unit. Often a small group representing the typical domains, platform, network, DB, apps, and service desk can come together periodically and review or discuss the opportunities, particularly the ones that maybe uh, require a larger investment or cross-team cooperation on the log and prioritize them as an outcome of that meeting. Again, it should be relatively quick and based on gut. If the anticipated LOE is great or there is drastically different perspectives on an anticipated level of effort or value, you know, further discussion should be had to surface the underlying differences in the perspectives. And in fact, this is a very constructive conversation to have because it often leads to greater understanding across the domains and ultimately better choices and priorities. Uh, so, Paul, it looks like we've got another question here. So how often should we do the prioritization and how long should it take? <laughs> it shouldn't take long because we don't have much time, obviously. But um, the answer is, of course, uh, it depends. Um, primarily on the number and activity around the entries in the log. Uh, obviously, the more new entries uh, require additional time, but any one entry should not require more than a few minutes to discuss. A good starting point might be to review once every two weeks if you have initially a, a, a large number of ideas coming in, um, and then you can change that um, as, as the activity level uh, moderates in the log. Um, there are even opportunities uh, for doing it almost real time in tools like Teams, uh, where you can just be reviewing and interacting with the Teams channel uh, and commenting on the tasks that hit the log. It's a good question. Um, once the prioritized opportunities are approved or marked for a pursuit, who tracks them? Um, it's very important, as we said, to track and communicate the status of these things. Again, this can be done at any level, but the key is that it is done and it's consumable by both operations and the business. Uh, assignment of tracking status could be a single individual or different individuals assigned to particular opportunities and is as simple as a follow-up to determine if the anticipated value was realized, and if not, make some determination as to why not. Uh, the status can, be, again, be tracked in the log itself as another column in a spreadsheet or a Teams planner bucket, uh, or any tool that you choose that can support these very basic logging and reporting capabilities. So we understand the obstacles and we have a general approach that provides some structure to execute in spite of the obstacles. Where do we, where do we look for value, particularly in operations? Um, at a high level everywhere, regardless of your role, again, everyone has a different perspective and every one of those perspectives re represents uh, potential value. But if you take five minutes at the end of the week or the day and look back and consider what you did and what interactions you had that seemed inefficient, ineffective, or pointless in some cases, extreme cases, I hope, uh, you have just identified value opportunities. Uh, consider them in the value ops or value context and do your gut check assessment. How could it be better? How often does this happen? Does it happen enough to be you know, something that we need to invest in to address? What would it take to correct it? And if after doing that, you feel that the general effort or investment would be offset by the benefit in terms of saved hours or dollars, then log it to the value log. Even if it doesn't pass the gut check, you know you made a very thoughtful and business-oriented review and came to a conclusion one way or the other. And perhaps that new understanding of the why it is the way it is and maybe it isn't worth pursuing uh, because of the lack of business value or return on investment. So with that said, a few key areas to consider as sources. Um, automation, of course, automation's on everybody's list today, um, including general orchestration of technology interaction in your day-to-day -day, uh, integration as well, and UI automation, leveraging technologies such as RPA. Pretty much anything that you do during the day that is repetitive or during the week or month uh, is a good target for automation. Analysis, uh, which is a very broad term, but generally the review of available operational data. This could be from the service desk, your monitoring tools, um, any, any type of information that you have available on operations to really learn new things about your operations and surface potentially significant opportunities. Historically, this was given lip service, uh, but in reality, most organizations did not have the luxury 
of time and resources to do that analysis, even in uh, proactive uh, processes that were geared towards um, this type of analysis, like problem management. Uh, thankfully, today we have a lot of new analytic capabilities and solutions, and then they've now made that analysis uh, somewhat automatic, and more importantly, the outcomes readily available uh, to use and identify value opportunities. Another great source is, again, uh, relying on the folks who were actually doing operations, and that would be the operational feedback. Uh, as mentioned earlier, those really are the best to identify the inefficiencies in the day-to-day -day and are usually very willing to share those opportunities. Uh, these could be technical, process, or organization in nature, and all should be considered. Of course, routine and perhaps quarterly review of strategic vendor releases for the tools that you may be using in your environment is a very critical source of, uh, uh, of new capabilities and, and value opportunities, and certainly review of emerging industry trends to identify those capabilities that may speak to one of your identified inefficiencies or objectives. And this in turn can lead to a well-justified value-driven upgrade activity. And of course, many, many more, but these are, these are some of the typical ones and you can typically review these areas uh, and uh, drive quite a bit of value out of most organizations. Hey, Paul. Uh, so before we move on, uh, let's open up another poll. So I'm gonna launch this real quick. Okay, so today, do you have a structured approach to managing and driving value within IT operations? Are you capturing the opportunities? Can you easily show the value delivered in the last 12 months? Can you share what value you intended to deliver in the next six months? Are you capturing the opportunities? So we'll give this a few more seconds. We've got about 50% of the audience so far. Still climbing up there. All right. So still climbing. Got a great audience today. Lots of lots of answers coming in. That's great. All right, so let's close this out now. And we'll share the results real quick. Okay, so right around 50-50, but it uh, looks like the, the majority um, are saying no. So interesting, interesting results there. Yeah, that's great. Great feedback. And thanks, thanks for being honest about that. Um, the, uh, for those, again, that, that have something in place, that's great. Um, and uh, hopefully you have all of the elements that we'll speak about today. And for those who don't, hopefully, again, we'll, we can get you heading in that direction. So again, um, we're gonna talk about an approach. And uh, on the next slide, we'll talk about uh, a, a perspective that represents uh, value ops, what we call value ops. There we go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so in the top of the gut diagram, you'll see uh, um, we have strategy and architecture, which typically applies uh, to most organizations that provides the guide rails for anything that we do from a technology perspective. Uh, and then we have the typical sources uh, at the next level, which we just discussed, where we're identifying uh, new capabilities and opportunities for, for value. And then at the next level, we actually capture those things in a value log of some sorts and prioritize them. And then those lead to uh, either configurations, which are the kind of the quick wins, or uh, the larger initiatives and projects, which might require a little bit more scrutiny. Um, and then finally, at the bottom, the communication, which again is the delivered value and plan value. So, with, that is ultimately the goal. It's a very high level concept and uh, it's not a complex concept um, by definition. And so here is an example how we might get uh, started with something like this in a very basic law. Again, something as simple as a spreadsheet and a suggestion box or opportunity box uh, from an email perspective can be used to capture the opportunities. In this example, the basic value log is depicted as a spreadsheet. And the screenshot, of course, does not reflect all of the columns you want, but is intended to demonstrate some of the key elements you might find in, or include in your log, wherever it may be. First is a high-level objective. 
Uh, again, we want to make sure that there is a high level objective uh, associated with every opportunity. And in reality, you could probably link it to any number of objectives, but you want to make sure that there's at least one. If there isn't, you've got to question uh, exactly why you're doing uh, that, uh, uh, pursuing that opportunity. Next is a brief description of the opportunity in terms that most should understand without any significant technical background. Ideally, you should capture uh, the source of the opportunity to not only be able to follow up for additional details or discussion, but perhaps even to use or to drive a recognition program for those participating and delivering value. And this, of course, would also help drive the change in culture if that was required in your environment. Next are the gut level ROI components of level of effort and the financial or organizational impact that we talked about. Again, not a complex ROI analysis, but a gut level, you know, is it small, medium, or large? We should not be spending more than a, a minute or two on each one of these, unless there is a debate um, amongst per perspectives. Once items are on the log, those components, you can begin to objectively you know, prioritize the efforts. And of course, the prioritization can change week to week or month to month um, based on new entries hitting the log or changing business requirements. And finally, some indication of a statement of expected value. It's great if you can identify a specific KPI, uh, but at a minimum, it must include some reasonable or meaningful summary of value. Obviously, if the LOE or investment is larger, you're going to have to do more of a formal ROI, um, but that should, you know, that should be uh, minimal and, and really expected on a larger initiative. Hey, Paul, real quick, we actually uh, had another question come in from the audience. And sure. the question is, so who should be doing uh, the review? Someone internal to a project or another party who understands the goal? Um, in terms of the prioritization, um, as I said, it, it really depends on the scope of the uh, of the opportunity. But typically, it would be someone like a, a small group that is associated with the various groups that might be involved, and, and certainly someone who has uh, an understanding of of the business priorities. One of the things that's that's kind of interesting is that we often get into these discussions. And um, at certain ports, parts of the organization, a clear understanding of the, of the high-level business objectives uh, can sometimes be, be lost. Uh, so you would want to make sure that someone has that perspective with them. And, uh, and again, you would want to have uh, representative perspectives uh, from the different groups involved. Does that help? Awesome. Shane, thanks for the great question. Uh, let, let's, let's keep those questions coming. Yep. All right, well, we're on to the next slide here. This is just another example. Um, I know how many organizations are leveraging Microsoft Office 365 today, particularly in light of the work from home trend. We use this here internally as well. And if you're one of those organizations, the Teams application and more specifically the planner capability, which is essentially a Kanban board uh, within Teams can be leveraged to set up a working value ops type mechanism literally in a few minutes. There are some limitations in terms of defining new fields for tasks or items, uh, but you can quickly get up and get going uh, with something that, like the simple example shown here. At the top is a default planner view with buckets defined for logged, approved, work in progress, delivered, and blocked opportunities. Um, each task within those buckets represents an identified opportunity in its current position within the activity workflow. Uh, an opportunity can be moved from log to approved when evaluated and target dates and responsible parties could be assigned. Uh, the responsible party could then move the opportunity to work in progress and update the opportunity card as appropriate. Ultimately, the opportunity would either be moved to the delivered bucket for those items that met the value expectations or to the blocked bucket if some obstacle remained, each serving its respective purpose, and that is communicating the value delivered and identifying stranded value. Another handy view available in the Teams Planner is the dashboard on the lower left that gives a great summary of the value opportunities and their various states at a glance. Essentially a value dashboard, if you will. Um, finally, on the right-hand side and on the bottom, the Teams Planner provides a schedule view that also allows you to support that concept of value opportunities uh, in a calendar view or essentially the a plan value perspective. Again, keep it simple as possible so that it does not become a drag on the system 
but rather an accelerator for value. So benefits, in a nutshell, why would you bother? Uh, I think in general, it, it's, it's fairly obvious and obviously some of you are already doing it, but in summary, it's to establish a clear operations value message to the business, not just a point in time, on, but ongoing. Uh, to objectively focus your efforts on activities that directly relate to business objectives and are evaluated and prioritized in a business context. Um, to drive operations improvements that lead to recovered time so that you can support additional innovation and, and competitive advantage. And of course, um, last but certainly not least is increased job satisfaction. As I said, we're, I think we're all driven uh, by a uh, desire to contribute value and uh, real ROI. And certainly we want to do that uh, in our day-to-day -day operations lives. Paul, that's awesome. like over it's yeah. a really, really great information there. And, and thanks so much for sharing that with everybody. Uh, so now that we've seen the framework for, for driving value in IT operations, I'm actually going to hand it over to James. Uh, and he's going to share a couple of case studies on how Netrio customers have identified opportunities to drive value and how they've used the Netrio platform to execute on those opportunities. So, James, go ahead and uh, take it away. Thanks, Kyle. So this first example actually is a uh, supermarket chain um, across most of the southeastern United States. And the challenge that they had was that they had evolved an NMS platform over many years of just getting different tools for different silos and you know to solve specific problems. And so had ended up with uh, a lot of disparate tools, but no comprehensive view. So they wanted to consolidate that. And they realized that they actually were spending a huge amount of money on training their engineers on how to use all of these different uh, platforms, and it wasn't really giving them any payback because of that. Um, they also needed to be able to automate more of what they were doing in IT, specifically around device configuration management and policy enforcement, and also, you know, the ability to really scale up to handle all of the different technologies that they were building into the business. Um, and they really wanted to get, uh, you know, kind of one tool to be able to accomplish this goal. So what we were able to do for them is we were able to unify their management platforms um, into a single uh, product line, into our, our product, and allow them to scale up. So they were monitoring about 5,000 devices over all their network. We were able to deploy and give them visibility into a much larger subset of their devices um, and spread that out to over 17,000 devices initially. Um, and this was a few years ago. They're now actually up over 50 or 60,000 devices being monitored. We were also able to give them um, good visibility into their long-term trends and automate a lot of those uh, repetitive processes that they were spending a lot of time doing manually. So, you know, instead of taking a week to have, you know, five engineers update 2,000 devices, uh, you know, for a, a password rotation, um, you know, they can automate that process and do the whole thing within minutes or, or uh, you know, even completely autonomously now to make sure that their configuration policy is enforced. And what they measured in terms of uh, the value and return on this, you can go to the next slide, Kyle. So they actually commissioned a time and motion study for their engineers and found that by consolidating their platforms into a much easier to use format, they were able to improve their engineer efficiency by 77% and start proactively fixing problems. They were also able to reduce the amount of training budget for their IT staff by 98%. They were spending so much money on training for all these different difficult to use, complicated products um, that by replacing them with our platform, which is designed to be primarily self-taught and very intuitive, they drastically reduced um, the amount of money they had to spend on that. And they were also able to reduce the admin and server footprint for maintaining all of those different platforms by 95%. So they really achieved uh, an immediate and measurable ROI um, and were even able to improve their ticket creation time by fully automating that process into their ITSM uh, with our platform. So they got a, a very quick payback on that investment and were able to deploy it into their environment very quickly. 
Now, this next example is actually a large hospital network in the northeastern United States, and they had a similar problem with tool overload, but in their specific case, they had a much larger IT organization, and one of the real pain points that they were starting to get was the different teams were kicking issues down between each other. So a ticket would come in, and the help desk would assign it to the database team, and the database team would kick it to the network team, who'd then kick it to the storage team, who'd then kick it back to the database team sometimes. And it, all of this passing around of the buck was causing them to spend a lot more time to resolve issues than really needed to be happening. Plus, they had so many different tools that when an, a major outage happened in the environment, they would get you know alarms from multiple different systems. The storage team gets one alarm, the application team gets the same alarm, the database team gets another alarm, and the network team gets another alarm. And all of those teams were running around in parallel trying to troubleshoot those problems um, before they really realized what was going on. And so they were spending a lot of time uh, and, and money and effort on you know redundant troubleshooting that was just not very effective. So what we were able to do for them is we were actually able to consolidate 30 different NMS platforms into their single into our single platform and have the whole thing rolled out for their entire environment into production in less than 90 days. We were able to give them a single global view for the command center while still giving them uh, individualized views for the different teams. So every team felt like they still had their own tools, um, but they were all coming from a single centralized source of truth, which made their root cause problem detection a lot faster. Um, we were also able to reduce their server footprint from 40 separate servers down to three, um, which is really just one central server with the redundant cluster. And we were able to give them automated reporting um, as well as part of that process, which they had not been able to achieve with their other platforms. They even were in the situation where they had five different types of storage arrays from EMC, and every single one of those storage arrays had a different dashboard. They couldn't consolidate them even using EMC's own management products. Um, so we were able to really streamline uh, that process for them and integrate all of that uh, into their existing environment for ITSM with ServiceNow and using uh, SCOM alerting, which they wanted to maintain for their servers, uh, into a single global dashboard for the whole environment. And the results that they got from that were immediate and definitely uh, significant. So they were able to reduce their time to root cause detection by 83% and the time it took to onboard new devices into monitoring um, went from days or sometimes even weeks down to minutes. Um, as a result of cutting down their MTTR uh, by 45% and reducing ticket creation times, they were actually able to reduce their overall IT operating costs by 45% in the first year alone and by 75% by the third year, just by real realizing efficiencies in less parallel troubleshooting, faster MTTR and faster time to root cause detection, um, they were able to achieve a, a massive payback on this investment and they've been a, a very happy customer with us for many years now. All right. James, thanks so much for tying all that together. It's really, it's amazing how powerful this framework can be when you put it into action. Uh, so before we move on, uh, I'd like to see if we have any questions and remind everyone uh, to get any additional questions in before we come to a close. Uh, we've got a few minutes left and uh, just a couple slides left here. So um, don't be afraid to, to drill us. All right. So, I see that many of you uh, are actually not Netro users. So for the uninitiated, uh, founded in 2000, Netro has been in the business of full stack monitoring for over two decades. Uh, users of the Netro platform come from all over the globe in just about every industry you can think of. And the Netro platform plays extremely well in industries that are highly regulated, like finance, aerospace, transportation, require high reliability and scalability, like healthcare and life sciences and have real-time mission criticality like emergency services. So backed by years of data, multiple patents, Netro is recognized as a leader in IT mon management and monitoring. Netro has been recognized as Network Compute Computing's monitoring product of the year for four straight years. And we were also recently named a high performer in G2 Crowd's enterprise monitoring, network monitoring, and IT alerting grid reports. So Netro is also rated uh, the highest rated vendor based on customer reviews in the most recent Gartner Peer Insights Voice of the Customer Report, and just recently named to the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies list for the fourth consecutive year. So with that, Paul uh, and Alex, uh, would you like to share a bit more about Whitlock? Thanks, Kyle. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity, and for those 
who are not familiar with uh, Whitlock Infrastructure Solutions, we are an operations-focused consulting organization. We've been focused on operations for over 20 years, and obviously we're driven by value in everything we do. In fact, every engagement and every aspect of our engagements from planning to delivery focus on ensuring there are clear value outcomes understood, the critical elements of value are defined and present, and the expected value is ultimately realized. And again, feel free to reach out to learn more about how we can help you plan your path to your next generation operations. And, and again, a sincere thanks uh, from the Whitlock team uh, for your time today. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we do have a few minutes left here. So let's open up the floor for some additional questions. And uh, while we do so, uh, please let us know how the Netrio Whitlock teams can assist you uh, further. So I'm going to open up a poll here. Uh, and this is multi-select, so feel free to select all that apply. All right, so I'm going to go back to our questions here. All righty. Uh, okay, so Paul, Alex, sounds like this one's for you. So the question is, how long does it take to do a value-first assessment? It really depends on the, the scope of what you want to explore, but typically an hour uh, is, is plenty to do a kind of a high level, um, you know, workshop and discovery um, and focus on, we typically would focus on maybe what is the most critical objective uh, from your perspective. Uh, and then certainly we can expand that as necessary. Okay, great. Oh, got awesome. We got the questions flowing in here. Okay, so uh, James, I think you can cover this one. How is the Netrio product licensed? Yeah, so in order to keep the licensing as simple as possible, we simply license by the number of devices, and we basically count a device as any logical operating system. So, you know, a virtual machine counts as a single license, even if we're monitoring 200 processes and, you know, 15 hard drives on it. Um, you know, a single stack of switches, um, you know, would count as a single uh, device if it's managed as a single logical entity. Um, so we've tried to keep it as, as simple as possible by just basically counting the operating systems and not trying to get into, you know, looking at individual monitors or looking at individual, you know, uh, values that we might be monitoring. Because one of the things that we do, especially like in a server environment, is we actually monitor all of the processes running on the server automatically for CPU and memory. So if we were, if we were licensing, you know, like some companies do by counting the number of monitored elements, there would be, you know, four or 500 on an average server and it would just get out of hand. So we just try to keep it as easy as possible. All right. So, and Paul, this one actually looks like uh a follow up to the first question that you that you answered so how much effort does it take uh from the company side to make a, a value first uh, assessment happen uh it it doesn't take a lot but it does take participation um so uh, again it depends on the objective that you're focusing on it would have to be uh participation from folks who are related to the objective and have some insight into it um, and ultimately some decision makers. So um, I, I, it's, it's tough to be a little bit more specific about that without understanding some of the high level objectives that you have, but um, um, that's, a, that's a high level summary. And uh, if you can be more specific, I, I might be able to be a little bit more specific on the answer. Okay, and so it looks like there's another follow up to that question. So what type of information is needed? Um, really, in terms of the objective, it's it's what's what are you trying to do, and what is the underlying problem? And this is, while it seems obvious, um, we often get engaged in these conversations or workshops, if you will, um, where the customer believes they understand what the underlying problem is, and they may not. Um, so we'll have a discussion about that and explore whatever the objective is, and ask probing questions around it to try and get to the to the underlying issue of it. Then once we under, understand the underlying issue or you know, kind of primary obstacle to the objective, um, then we can start talking about you know, the irrefutable capabilities that are required. Okay, if you're trying to achieve X, Y, Z, that means you must have this capability in place, you must have this capability in place, and you must have this capability in place. And we'll talk through those and make sure that they're irrefutable and that we've got a good list of those, and then we'll we'll move on through the process to identify, okay, if we had these capabilities, who would be consuming them? 
who in the organization would be leveraging these capabilities? Are they in this room right now? Do they know you're you're even talking about these capabilities? And then we would then explore the expected value. So um, once we have those things outlined, then we can have you know a reasonable conversation about okay, this is this is what we're trying to do. This is who's going to be uh, leveraging it in the organization. Here are the capabilities we have, and we can build a solution and ultimately a plan to to achieve that. And we can also capture. Uh, those high level of kind of value statements about what we anticipate uh, coming out of the project. And depending on the size of it, again, that might be the gut check kind of thing. If it's a, if, if it's a relatively minor endeavor, um, if it's a larger endeavor, it would, it, would, it would certainly lean more towards kind of an ROI analysis, but we would do a gut check on that first before you even bothered with, uh, with anything else on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we're, we're right at about time here, um, but we do have one more question. So I'm going to pass this to James and then we'll wrap up. So uh, James, can you explain uh, the mobile management uh, a bit more? I think that's referring to Netrio mobile app. Yeah, so uh, we provide a, a full functional mobile application for iOS and Android that gives you access to all of the data within your management platform. It's designed so that you don't have to set up any special servers or use any kind of VPN connections to be able to get secure access to your data. Um, and it's designed so that you can just switch it on, um, you know, through the user interface uh, with kind of a, a minimum amount of hassle. And then you've got full access to all of your, you know, graphs and reports and, and dashboards, um, you know, right there on your mobile device. Awesome. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. Uh, it was an awesome webinar. Thanks again to, to Paul, Alex, James. Um, that was awesome. So. Um, we, uh, we look forward to speaking with all of you soon, um, and we'll follow up with everybody who filled out the poll. Um, but please feel free to reach out to Netrio or Whitlock uh, for more information on how to evolve your next-gen operations. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.